Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ajay. Good afternoon and good evening. It's my privilege to welcome you all to the third voice of the Global South Summit and our session today on people-centric approach to global finance. As Prime Minister Narendra Modi observed, the two previous summits have sent a clear message to the world that the Global South wants its autonomy. Global South wants to be heard on global governance. Today, our voice is not only being heard, but also acted upon. The G20 New Delhi Leaders Declaration of September 2023 and the BRICS Leaders Johannesburg Declaration of August 2023 are examples of this rising influence in international negotiations. The inclusion of the African Union as a permanent member of the G20 and the addition of six emerging markets and developing economies to the BRICS group has improved the representation, bringing much needed attention to the unique challenges of the global south. We must maintain this momentum. India remains committed to, the, to ensuring that the global south takes on a larger role in shaping global development governance. We view this gathering as an invaluable platform for sharing and showcasing best practices, knowledge, and also resources. I seek your continued collaboration in deepening our efforts to maximize our collective impact. Excellencies, I would like to draw your attention to a pressing challenge that hinders developing economies from achieving their development goals. Inadequate access to development finance. Recent reports reveal that the implementation of many SDGs in developing economies is stagnating, with some indicators even regressing. The SDG financing gap is estimated at 4 trillion US dollars annually for developing countries. The global south is disproportionately affected by global uncertainties. I invite your ideas and suggestions on how to ensure a people-centric approach to securing global finance. Before I open the floor, I would like to share a few thoughts. Growth remains the best antidote to many economic and social challenges. Growth creates a positive feedback, a positive feedback loop where improved economic performance leads to greater financial opportunities and vice versa. Our priority should be a people-centric growth path that empowers the most vulnerable and marginalized to participate in the development journey. The World Bank's June 2024 report states that by the end of this year, one in four developing economies will be poorer than they were before the pandemic. Growth thus remains insufficient to drive progress in development and poverty reduction. To accelerate progress on SDGs, there is an urgent need to address the $4 trillion financing gap. During India's presidency, the G20 recommended wider adoption of social impact instruments and other blended finance instruments, monitoring and measurement frameworks, and risk mitigation measures. Our efforts also led to the G20 Sustainable Finance Technical Assistance Action Plan, which is now being implemented under the Brazilian presidency to build capacity for scaling up sustainable finance 
tailored to the needs of global south. I seek your ideas on how we can further enhance south-south cooperation in scaling up financing from all sources. Taking a cue from what we heard during the last Voice of Global South Summit, the Indian Presidency in 2023 provided a big push to the MDB reform agenda with two key objectives. To ensure that MDBs are comprehensively revamped so that they can mobilize the much needed additional financial flows to help developing countries meet their development needs and address global challenges. And second, to ensure that the voices and perspective of countries who borrow from the MDBs are at the heart of the reform process. I'm glad to note that the G20 discussions are being translated both in spirit and substance into the ongoing MDB reforms. Let me share a few aspects of high priority in the MDB reform agenda. It is critical that the financing requests made to MDBs are met with speed and agility. This will require reforms both at operational levels as well as identifying new additional sources of finance. Fresh capital infusion should remain an active option for consideration of MDB boards along with balance sheet optimization, along with balance sheet optimization measures and financial innovations. On concessional finance, while low-income countries will remain the priority, it is important that the dedicated concessional windows are made available for middle-income countries to address climate-related challenges. On private capital mobilization, MDBs need to engage with credit rating agencies and explore how to better incentivize the flow of private capital for development financing. <clears throat> Sorry. I invite your views on where more action is needed on the MDB reform agenda and how we can collaborate better as the voice of the global south. Elevated debt distress and high debt service costs have severely constrained resource available for financing developmental needs, particularly in low-income countries. Estimates indicate that nearly half of the world's population resides in countries where interest expenses exceed spending on education and health. Tight global financial conditions and pro-cyclical sovereign credit rating have restricted access of developing economies to market finance, making them resort to riskier sources of financing, exposing them to currency, interest rate, and refinancing risks. The underlying drivers of debt distress are complex. Addressing them will take time and effort involving a combination of short, medium, and long-term measures and continuous policy engagement at national and global levels. I invite your views on how to strengthen the efficacy of existing mechanisms for debt relief and liquidity support for low- and middle-income countries, including the G20 Common Framework and the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable. Additionally, I seek your ideas on the safeguards to be put in place to prevent future debt crises. Developing countries continue to face significant shortfalls in climate financing. 
Research indicates that developing countries require approximately 6 trillion US dollars by 2030 to achieve just half of the existing nationally determined contribution targets. The current level of financing falls far short of the climate adaptation needs of developing countries expected to reach $500 billion by 2050, five to 10 times greater than the current funding levels. I seek your suggestions on pragmatic actions to address this issue. Around 1.4 billion adults worldwide remain financially excluded, with half of them residing in emerging markets and developing economies. India has shown that last mile financial inclusion can be a strong enabler for countries to achieve at least seven SDGs. G20 leaders in 2023 endorsed policy recommendations for the use for advancing financial inclusion and productivity gains through the use of digital public infrastructure. India also announced the creation of a social impact fund to accelerate DPI implementation in the global south. I'm happy to share that in 2023, India committed 2 million US dollars towards the African Development Financial Inclusion Facility. Recently, India has further committed a grant of about 6 million US dollars for, for a five year period, which will support activities related to the African Development Financial Inclusion Facility along with capacity building, knowledge sharing, infrastructure development, and technical assistance in the preparation of feasibility studies, among others. It is encouraging to see that Jordan, Rwanda, the Philippines, Indonesia, Ghana, and Colombia have advanced their financial inclusion efforts. Your Excellencies, I will stop here and invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions. Thank you.